We have taken the month of February, if you are a guest with us today, uh, we've taken the month of February and um, we've talked about what we call healthy homes. The idea behind this study is that uh, we are examining the scriptures and looking at some of those components that set us up for success in our homes, some of the things that will uh, make life healthier, easier, more centered on Christ. We spent the first two weeks of February talking about the core component of marriage, um, what we call goals for a successful marriage. Last week, we talked about developing godly children and how uh, parents and grandparents can play the role in um, forming the next generation of those who would be seeking after God's own heart. And I know the stories of a lot of you, I know how important that is to you to be able to see the next generation and the generation after that follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And I pray that that was an encouragement to you last week. You know, but one of the, one of the things that tends to, as a pastor, you have the opportunity to do some really fun counseling and some really difficult counseling. In the aspect of both premarital and postmarital counseling, oftentimes, um, you know, children and finances tend to be uh, struggling points as, as couples figure out how to do life together. Um, so today's message I've entitled Secrets to Finding Fi- Family Financial Commitment. Secrets to Finding Family Financial Contentment. And this isn't a, this isn't a typical, I hope this isn't a typical Uh, oh, we're here, the pastor's talking about money. This is where the pastor is going to say, you know, give us all your money. (laughs) Anybody who knows me, that's not me. And uh, I mean, I'll I'll preach it. If it's in the Bible, we preach it and we talk about it um, because I believe that there's healthy disciplines there. But more than that, I want to help everybody in the room this morning sort of take a step back and look at what the Scripture has to say about one of the key aspects of our life that tends to consume us, that tends to tear us down if we're not careful, that tends to gnaw away at us and leave us with, uh, you know, just a a constant craving for a bottle of Tums maybe. I I don't know. But finances, and in our families especially, just creates a friction that, I think God did not intend for it to be that way. I get it. Everybody's all over the map on how much money we make and the difficulty in paying bills and the challenges of planning for the future. But I think the scripture also speaks to some principles that are overarching that sort of rise above that, um, that can help us have a better, healthier perspective no matter where we're at. And maybe relieve some of that pressure that is felt within the family. You know, I was raised in a, um, not to make it about me, but I was raised in a uh, lower middle class home in the city. My father was a police officer for 25 years. Oftentimes, you know, around the holidays or uh, in the summer, if we wanted to do a family vacation, it meant that dad had to take a second or third job. So he would, he would get off work, whatever his shift was. And then he would, he would go to the mini mart and he would work for another six or seven hours to, make some extra money, and um, never heard my father complain ever about doing those things. It was just in his nature and who he was. But I do remember mom and dad having a lot of um, sometimes animated late night conversations after the children went to bed about the financial picture of the home and how to pay for this and how to do that. Things are changing quickly financially in this country, aren't they? Uh, who would have thought that? Um, who would have thought that a, a dozen eggs would cost the price of two gallons of gas? It's crazy. But in America, we're still really blessed. You know, in 1976, the average supermarket in the United States stocked 9,000 items. Today, the average supermarket in the United States stocks over 30,000 items. 
If you want gluten-free Thai peanut sauce, you can go to Publix and find it. Uh, if you want organic cage-free eggs, range-free, raised by chickens who are tattooed with peace signs, you can go find it at Publix or at Winn-Dixie or wherever you want to shop. I don't think the issue in America is so much what we don't have or what we can't afford. I think the issue in America is personal contentment. What satisfies us? And So as we come to the text today, we're going to really hit on two main texts. I want to redefine personal contentment for us and dig into that a little bit. All right, so let's, let's pray and then let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Father, I, I come to your word this morning in humility and with much expectation that you're going to share with us a truth that's going to change our lives. As always, the Holy Spirit is invited here to teach. May it not be my words that are shared this morning, but may it be the words of the living God, the one who died for us, the one who bankrupted heaven in order that we might be rich in ways we don't even fully comprehend. Lord, may we look at our lives with fresh eyes and with a renewed heart today. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So as I said, I think the first secret to finding family financial contentment and contentment financially in our own lives is that first point. We need to redefine personal contentment. Too much keeping up with the Joneses. It just overruns us. It absorbs us. It, 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 it will kill us over time. That your neighbor has a boat and we need to have a boat. That your neighbor buys brand name and you buy generic. You know what I mean? Like This kind of stuff can eat us away. So how do we find and how do we redefine personal contentment? Well, I thought of the... Apostle Paul and his words in Philippians 4. We don't often think of this as a financial passage, but really it is. When you read it, you'll start to see what I mean. Beginning in verse 10, Paul said this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Yes, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So you say, oh, maybe that is, maybe he is talking a little bit about money there, the Apostle Paul. We think I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and we immediately think of you know Tim Tebow diving across the goal line to win the game for the University of Florida. And we think of, you know, Philippians 4.13 on the eyeliner of professional athletes or whatever the case may be. Maybe Paul's talking about being able to do all things through Christ that doesn't merely have to do with weightlifting or athletics or some supernatural feat of strength. Maybe Paul's talking about learning to be content and trusting God to fill in the gaps and to push us forward in whatever it is He calls for us in our life. So, 
I said redefine personal contentment, and I think the first way we do this in your note sheet is this. Focus on Christ's strength. You want to redefine personal contentment. First and foremost, focus on Christ's strength and what He can do and not what you think you can do. Because here's what will happen. Christ's strength enables you to handle much, but I love this. Paul said, I've learned to abound, but I've learned to go without, right? So when we focus on Christ's strength, it enables you to handle much, but it also enables you to handle little. What jumped out at me here is Paul's references to both being able to handle a lot and a little. You don't hear a lot of people brag about the fact that they can handle a lot or that they can handle a little depending on the circumstance and how you look at it, right? Like, um, you don't hear people go around saying, you know, like, I got nothing. I really, I mean, like, we're really struggling. But I'm good with it. I can handle it. Like, you don't hear, I'm blessed because we're struggling to pay the bills. You just don't hear that often. And I understand. We may be used to calling out to God when we're in little, But Paul says it's Christ that's the secret to handling abundance as well. I've met a lot of people that don't handle abundance very well. When I was a banker in my previous life, now a long time ago, before I was a pastor, I remember turning down a guy for a loan who just a few years earlier had won the lottery because he had blown through everything. And now he needed a loan to cover his lifestyle. And he didn't have any money to pay for it. So, what happens in life, coffers dry up. We go through seasons where financial stability goes away. And we're familiar with the idea of clinging to Jesus. At least we should be during those times. Because... Scripture is very clear, not just in Paul's epistles, but throughout the whole entire text of the Bible. In Jesus, we have everything. Now, you may be like, yeah, I get that, Pastor, but like, you know, the Bible's not paying my bills. I understand. It's a hard lesson for us in this country. It's why it's so important, I think, that... Um, as believers in Jesus, we get a global perspective rather than just simply an American perspective. I don't know the exact statistics, but I'm going to guess that the poverty line in the United States of America is, is probably at least a dozen times higher than what the average income is in the rest of the world. Um, And that's what makes it a hard lesson for us in this country. Because it forces us, it requires, it demands of us to contemplate what's needed to live with much. And what a little actually is. I don't think we, in the American church today, I don't think we have a healthy perspective on what a little really is. Our having much versus Paul saying that he had much, I think are very different definitions. When we say we have much, and Paul says he has much, I think Paul's much looked a lot less than what we had or have. For Paul, having much, honestly, for Paul having much simply meant that he had the ability to do ministry the next day and the next day in the next day. As an American church, do we define much that way? And are we content in that? So, Christ's strength enables you to handle much and to handle little. But Christ's strength also enables you to handle success and to handle difficulties. That's what Paul says. In the midst of Paul's talk of how the Philippian church worked hard to meet his needs. He references his time leaving Macedonia. Now here's why this is important. I 
I love the Philippian church. I, I, I feel like it is an outstanding example of a church in the New Testament that's full of joy, that had their mission priorities straight. They were a sacrificial bunch of people, an evangelistic bunch of people. I love the church at Philippi. But Paul says, when I was leaving Macedonia, you were there for me. Because in Acts 16, Paul led to go to Macedonia. He was led by the Lord to go there at the start of the Philippian church. And you remember he ran into some problems. He started the church, the women by the waterside, and, uh, and uh, Lydia and her group there, and they became believers But then as the church in Philippi grew, so did the opposition. There was a sorcerer girl who was causing problems. As they cast out demons from her, some people started to get upset and they wanted to run Paul off. Eventually, uh, they ended up running him into jail with Silas. So there you have Paul and Silas unjustly in a prison cell late at night at midnight, chained. And Scripture says, Scripture says that they were there at midnight singing hymns, praise songs. What an amazing demonstration of a life infused with Christ and a genuine joy that accompanies that. That is learning to handle the difficulties. Singing hymns. The other prisoners were listening late at night. The power of the gospel shaking the place. The lights go out. The head jailer gets saved. Then his family gets saved. His family gets baptized. And the church in Philippi just continues to explode. Why? Because the power of Jesus in our lives is real. And it's not linked to what you have. Contentment is to say, whether I have much or I have little, it all belongs to Christ. And in that I'm content. May He use my little. May He use my much. This is when Paul then left Macedonia to go to Thessalonica. And this little fledgling church in Philippi of brand new believers, immature Christians, immediately began to ask questions like, how can we help Paul get Jesus to more people? If he can't stay here, wherever he goes, how can we fund his ministry? How can we make him more successful? So, As we redefine personal contentment, Christ's strength in your life is at the center of that. But then also as you redefine personal contentment, another thing I see here in Philippians 4 that's so important is that you you have to transfer your account to God's investment house. Transfer your account to God's investment house. Now, if you're like me, you get a little bit older, you start saving for retirement, right? Maybe you're blessed enough to have a little retirement account with an investment company or an investment holding company or whatever, a 401k, a 403b, a 409q, whatever you got. And, and you're saving for retirement and somebody is investing that money for you. And especially nowadays, right? Like we look at the stock, I look at the stock market and it just, I get disgusted. Most days I'm watching what's going on. And again, as a guy who has, has been a financial professional, I've, I've, in, I've invested for people, I've worked in the bank, I've uh, had you know, stockbroker licenses and all those things. I know better than to look at the market every single day. I know that. That's not, doesn't make any sense. But when you do, what you see is going on right now is you begin to question your future because you're watching it do this, go into the tank. And every day is another headline, you know. The Fed's raised the interest rate. Is Larry going to be able to retire? It's, it's just it's crazy. But 
But let me talk about the infusion of Christ's strength from the perspective of the Philippian church. Their biggest focus was just simply being good stewards. Ups, downs, in season, out of season, they were supporting Paul in the work of the Great Commission. And we know from Paul's writings, this just caused his heart to swell. He's like, the ones who have little, they're supporting me. The ones who have much, they're supporting me. Not that the gift is for me. The gift is about the fruit, he says. We get that confused in the church too. What we give to the gospel work isn't about this building. I mean, part of that gets peeled off to keep lights on, right? And to turn the air conditioning on and stuff. But it's bigger than that. It's about watching Jesus take that which has been given and making gospel ministry happen. Getting the gospel, the word of God, into people's hearts and minds. Part of the give and take Paul talks about here, he uses accounting terms for giving and receiving. And then he changes and he refers to what was given as a sweet sacrificial offering, he says. He says that what the church gave on his behalf was actually a sacrifice to God. They were transacting in God's account. They were making deposits in God's investment house. And you say, well, why is it important that, you know, I invest in God's investment house? I mean, what, what, what benefit is there to that? I'll tell you what. Because unlike the stock market that I'm watching every day that's going like this, God's investment house never runs dry. Ever. That's, that's verse 19 here. He says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Whose riches and glory? His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Everything you need, God will supply according to his, not your riches, his riches. Man, there is freedom in this. I wish I could just, I wish I could just take my heart out of my chest and, and, and share it with you and tell you and, 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 and transfer it to you about how deep of a lesson this has been in my life that I've learned. And oh, how I've been set free in learning that God, God's riches are sitting there in an account for me. And He's ready to peel off any of those riches as I have need. But they they don't have faces of Washington or Lincoln. His investments don't have faces of Washington and Lincoln. His his riches don't come in forms of silver and gold. His riches look like life. His riches look like eternal life. His riches look like blessings that you can't even put words to. There's contentment in realizing that you're dealing in that which is an eternal provision. I'll say this one last time. You can't drain God's account. Look at Psalm 50, one of my favorite verses in the Psalms. God says, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. Now, what God's not saying here is that He's going to bless you with cows. What God is saying here is, in the language of the day, that everything that the people in that day did for a source of life was His. God owned the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the cattle on a thousand... That's a lot of cows. And uh, so if you were a if you were a rancher, if you were a, a nomadic shepherd, whatever the animal was, it all belonged to God. And if you looked out as far as you could look, all the valleys, all the hills, as far as you could see, and you covered them all with animals, all that livestock belongs to God. And so it is in our lives. 
All the resources that make your life go belong to God. It's all mine, he says. And again, I'll reiterate, there's freedom in this. That ultimately a numbskull like me is not the one who's the owner of this stuff. That God's still in charge. I believe with all my being that one of the key components to contentment is dealing in what you have through God's account. Feeling limited in our resources might stem from our view of where those resources come from. If we are the sole source in our strength, we will worry and never find true contentment. When you realize that ultimately God is in control of what I have, ultimately God is in control of how that money gets used and what the fruit of that money is, how my resources get utilized, God's in charge of all that. Once you begin to come to that place, there's a, a freedom in that, right? Like where you begin to say, I don't, I, don't, I don't need to worry. As long as I'm doing as the Lord requires of my resourcing, God's got this. I'm not saying these are easy things to come by. I'm just saying that they're freeing things once you do come by them. The, the contentment is, is almost without words. When we're the sole source in our strength and in our resources, what happens is we begin counting before we begin serving, before we begin utilizing. We start looking at a ledger in our life and we say, well, I have this and I have this, but I don't have this and I don't have this. And the wrong thing in that whole statement is the word I. I don't have this and I don't have this, but I have this and I have this. So based on my assessment, I can do this, but I can't do this. Or I can only serve God this way, but I can't serve others this way. Instead of saying, in God's investment house, we look at God's investment house and we say, God has this, he has this, he has this, he has this, he has this, and he has everything else I can't even think of. Why would I not surrender my life and serve him with everything? Because if the resources are strictly for our benefit and not his kingdom, we'll never truly be content. I guarantee you that. So when you come together as a husband and wife, let's, let's put this in a marriage context. When you come together as a husband and wife, neither of you takes ownership of the resources. They're God's resources. We're both just stewards of those resources. John 6 Jesus talks about it this way. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves, right? The feeding the 5,000. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him God the Father has set His seal. And then He goes on in verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus had this wonderful way of turning a phrase, maybe using hyperbole a little bit to expand a spiritual concept. What Jesus is saying here is there are more important things than our belly. The Word of God, the truth of Jesus Christ, is always more important than the material in our lives. When we feast on Christ, there's a contentment in that and a fullness in that that you can never receive with material things. When it's Christ feeding you and fueling you, you'll never go hungry again. So, I love the story of George Mueller. You know who George Mueller is? He was a... uh, uh, he was a British philanthropist and a wonderful Christian man. He became known for starting all of these uh, orphanages in the 1800s. And uh, he oftentimes would, would start them with nothing. I mean, Mueller didn't have really the resources that he needed to get these things going. The story is told of uh, an orphanage that he started one time where he uh, 
brought all the children together and for breakfast, and there was no food for breakfast. Uh, a very real problem. And so he sat the children down at the table, and they, they said, what do we do? He said, well, we're going to pray. We're going to give thanks for the food that God has given. And the kids are looking around at each other like, this man's crazy. They pray, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a knock at the door. And uh, it's the, the local baker. And he said, an, an order that wasn't fulfilled, something like that. You know, too much bread. I, I, I was wondering if you had use for the bread. Yeah. A couple minutes later, there's a knock at the door. And it's the, it's the milk salesman, the milk delivery man. His cart broke down in front of the orphanage. And the milk was going to spoil. He needed to give it to somebody. Did the children have any need for milk? Those children watched as God met their needs in a very amazing and miraculous way. But they prayed first. They prayed fully expecting. Now this isn't a name it, claim it thing, gang. I don't preach that. But I believe that a lot of times we don't pray with enough expectancy that God's going to meet our needs and do extraordinary things. I believe God loves to do those kinds of things. Last point this morning. So we talked about focusing on Christ's strength, right? We redefine personal contentment. But the next thing with regard to financial contentment is this. Allow the kingdom to dictate your financial terms. Allow the kingdom to dictate your financial terms. Bear with me, because this is going to be a little hard. The average American household in 2023 has more than $43,000 in consumer debt beyond their mortgage. That's the highest since 2008, which was, you know, the financial crisis, which I would say we have another one. In this country right now, there are record credit card delinquencies going on in 2023. If a person owes $5,000 on credit, at today, credit cards at today's rate, a minimum payment will pay off that $5,000 debt in 191 months. And you'll pay over $6,000 in interest. $5,000 on a credit card, if you just make the minimum payments at today's interest rate, you're going to pay... $6,000 just in interest alone. A family and its leaders in the family should look to a higher level filter for their financial decisions than what the majority of Americans are doing today. I think a husband and a wife should sit down and seek to prioritize their financial decisions based upon the kingdom of God and what he would have for their resources based upon what the church ministry dictates. Look at Luke 12. This isn't me making this up. Luke 12, Jesus' words here in verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you'll put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the fields today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. 
For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. Jesus tells his disciples, life is more than food. I know, this this is a hard lesson. But life is more than food. The body more than clothing. Seek that which is above, he says. Where's your treasure? Nice clothes aren't sinful. I'm not saying that at all. I'm glad glad to see you all in nice clothes. Honestly, glad to see some of you just in clothes. (laughs) But here's here's the problem. It's not that nice clothes or a nice automobile, or a nice roof over your head, or whatever, is a bad thing. Treasuring them might be. A family that is free financially is free. You may not have much physically, but if you're free financially... You have a joy and a freedom that a lot of families in this country will never experience. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave to the lender. $43,000 in consumer debt beyond their mortgage. Maybe that's credit card debt, car debt, student loan debt. I don't know. I imagine all the above in some regards. I kind of see that, though, as 43,000 potential roadblocks to freely serving the Lord. Every dollar in debt is another reason why we choose not to invest in kingdom purposes. And please... I understand. I'm not, I'm not up here saying to you, you'll find financial, you'll be just the, the best Christian if you, if you get rid of your car paint. I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying as we grow and mature as believers, let's just first run everything through the higher kingdom filter and ask as we make these decisions, how is this going to help or hurt? The first question, how is this going to help or hurt my ability? to serve Christ to the maximum. And maybe, maybe, it's a $11,000 used automobile that, will allow, that we can more afford, that's going to allow us to be free, have that joy, and no pressure or anxiety of debt, and then be able to take that which we would be servicing to debt and invest in the kingdom. Um, everybody loves the preacher when he's talking about this stuff. <laughs> I'm not just talking free to give to the church either, which I believe is God's storehouse. It's our expected first outlet for ministry. It's our expected first uh, place of investment for our resources. But I, I, I believe in a tithe, and I believe beyond the tithe, in cheer. We seek opportunities to invest in God's kingdom beyond the scriptural tithe. But perhaps some of the things that we do in our life will just mean buying used. I'm married to the... It drives... Sometimes it drives my daughter and I batty, but we are married to the goodwill queen. I mean, (laughs) thrift shopping. 
thrift shopping. I give her a hard time sometimes. I mean, I'm really thankful for it. Sometimes I'm like, honey, you can buy a new pair of shoes. You don't have to wear somebody else's pants. And she's like, but look, these are great. Look at these. These are fantastic. Why would I need new pants when I can wear these? These are great. Now, I admire her. I admire her. But the attitude, as we've matured as believers over the years, and it's been a process, but the attitude has really come to, um, we can't outgive God because it's all His. So one of those filters we run it through is, you know, what can we do on our end so that the resourcing that God has given us can be used to His maximum potential? Um, I think as families, as, as individuals, as husbands and wives, as we start to live more by this mantra, that it all belongs to Him, He's the owner of the cattle on 10,000 hills, that God wants to resource us so that we can, like Paul said, like the Philippian church, so that we can serve kingdom purposes. We can give freely and lovingly and cheerfully so that we can watch missionary. I, you know, if the, if the church is getting smaller, sadly, in this country, and a lot of it, you know, I have, I have opinions on that, and I'll spare those for another day. I don't, I don't necessarily think it's a, an unusual or a bad thing. But the, um, I still believe that if, if, if the American church tithed, we could start the largest Christian production company. We could start the largest media production com- company in the world if we wanted to and get the gospel out there. We could put the Netflix and the NBCs and the CBA, we could put them all to shame. I believe we would never have to have a missionary leave the mission field to come home and raise money. I believe we could fund all the foreign missionaries we needed to reach every people group in the world, every language group in the world with the gospel. I believe it. If we're just faithful and we find contentment in whatever it is that God has given us. All right, that's enough of me yammering this morning. I... um, you can tell, I just really believe in this. It's revolutionized my life. It has changed my life. I, I don't, we're not a rich family. We don't, it just has, has made such an impact on us over the years, how we invest, how we, what we invest in, and this incredible, we're going to go farther out on the limb to try and reach the sweeter fruit. And to do that, sometimes it's, it's costly. But when you get out there, and you get the sweetest fruit at the farthest end of the branch, you never want to climb back. You, you just want to keep investing and doing more for God and watching God show off. Pray with me if you would.